It has been 15 years since Robert Fisher allegedly butchered his wife and two children before blowing up the family's Scottsdale, Arizona home. And after more than two decades on the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives list, Robert Fisher has yet to be apprehended. But most recently, the FBI has returned to the roots of the investigation in order to freshly review this case. Hey there, true crime fans. Welcome to another episode of the Always Talking Crime Podcast. I'm super, 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 super excited. This is episode 20, and we are going to be talking about Robert Fisher. And where the fuck is he? Is he dead? Is he alive? Um, Yeah, so I'm going to tell you the story, and you're going to... um, want to probably on my Instagram, I'm going to be posting all the pictures and the case sources and everything. Um, Let's have a conversation about what we think happened to this piece of shit of a person. I don't know. I guess he's a person, but um, he's definitely a piece of shit for sure. Now, before I even get started with this case, I do want to mention that it just literally started raining and it's been bright and sunny and hot and humid. I mean, this is Pensacola, Florida in the summertime after all, but, um, I was, I got back from an appointment and I took the dogs out for a walk real quick and, um, it was like already thundering and starting to get cloudy. So I knew it was going to start to rain, but in case you guys hear anything in the background, I guess it'll just add to our (laughs) ambiance. I really wasn't even sure how to start this case either. I'm going to list my case sources. Um, One of the case sources I fucking hated, just so you know. And yeah, here's a disclaimer. I'm sweary. Kimmy is sweary. Yes, I'm talking about myself in the third person. Kimmy is sweary. And if you don't like to hear sweary people, then this might not be the podcast for you. And um, sorry, not sorry. There's so many great podcasts out there. Maybe you'll find somebody that does not um, cuss like a sailor but um kimmy does so i just want to make that clear right now and i also wanted to tell you guys that um this is a true crime podcast sometimes you know i give you guys the disclaimer blah 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 you know don't listen if you're squeamish or you're you know underage or you have small children in the room um trigger warning trigger warning trigger warning just figure that if you're listening to a true crime podcast And if you're listening to Always Talking Crime, there's going to be plenty of trigger warnings. I'll try to mention them, but sometimes it's just kind of one of those things like, duh, there's going to be plenty of trigger warnings, okay? So don't get mad at me if you're triggered and I didn't specifically tell you what you might be triggered by because, like I already said, it's a fucking true crime podcast. So let's get it together, people. (laughs) I'm just being silly. But anyways, but it's true. (laughs) All right. So like I was saying, I wasn't sure how to start this case. I, I went back and forth about how I wanted to start it. I really wanted to start it with information about the victims. Um, but what really sucks is I could not find any background information about the three victims. 
And that just sucks because I would, I would much prefer to do a podcast episode and talk more about the victims, their background, what they were going through, you know, so on and so forth. But quite literally, I couldn't find anything of substance about the mother and these two children who are going to be brutally fucking murdered. So I guess I'm going to have to talk about the fucking dude that allegedly killed them, okay, and is a wanted fugitive. So that sucks. Um, I'm going to talk about one case source in particular quite a bit because I fucking hated it. It was the documentary. I don't know if, it, if it's even a documentary per se. It was like a movie that was directed by some Charlie dude that it seemed like this. I don't know if you saw it. It's called Where is Robert Fisher? It came out, gosh, like in the early 2000s sometime like that but um it's on youtube you can watch it for free it doesn't cost you any money to watch it i saw it's on tubi for free i saw it's on amazon prime for free it's all over the place free 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 and yes watch it for free because it's fucking not worth even a fraction of a penny like less than a penny it's it's worth like somebody should fucking pay you to watch it because it sucks so bad and they glorify fucking Robert Fisher so much and like I was getting fucking angry when I was watching it and then just to make sure I hated it I watched part of it a second time and I was like yes 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 I'm absolutely positive now for certain that I fucking hate this show so I guess that starting this episode I'm just gonna talk about Robert's background, like his childhood, and just kind of lead up to what happened with the victims and the murder and all that kind of stuff, okay? Here we go. Robert William Fisher was born on April 13th of 1961 in Brooklyn, New York. His father's name was William Fisher, and he worked as a banker. His mom's name was Jan Howell. Other than Robert, they also had two daughters. When Robert was 15 years old, they got divorced, and this was in the year 1976. After that, all three of the children went to live with their father in Arizona. They attended high school in Tucson, Arizona. The divorce was turbulent and reportedly had long-lasting effects on Robert. He seemed to be very bitter about the whole divorce and the whole breaking up about the family. And he even once confided to an associate that his life would have been very, very different had his mother, Jan, not left the family. So let me just say, I'm going to pipe in a little bit here because my first marriage i'm not going to get into a lot of my background and my history and everything but my first marriage i was married to an absolute fucking controlling asshole that hated me and at towards the end of the marriage that motherfucker would even like taunt me and tell me that i better sleep with one eye open so like it was not a safe feeling place for me to be so I don't know anything in particular about the marriage between William and Jan, but I will say that good on Jan for fucking leaving if it meant saving her life, okay? Fuck Jan if she just left just to leave because of whatever reason. Like, if she just left to go be with another man, fuck you, Jan. But if she legitimately left because um, it was safer for her to leave her husband and her children, then, like, I totally understand. And nobody can judge a person for anything like that unless they've actually experienced it. But anyways, Robert seemed to be very fixated and bitter on the fact that his parents got divorced. And, like it kind of shattered his whole, like, we're a perfect family belief. You know what I mean? 
After high school, Robert enlisted in the United States Navy. He attempted to become part of the Navy SEALs, but was not successful. And, like, good on him for even trying, because I know for a fact that out of all of the people that go into the SEALs training, a very small percentage of people make it through. So, I mean, it's it's so coveted, and it's so difficult. I mean, I know they go through Hell Week, and I know that other... Um, branches of the military maybe it's like Delta Force or something they all have their version of Hell Week and like nothing bad on Robert Fisher by saying he didn't become part of the Navy SEALs because I can't even imagine how difficult that was but he is a veteran or was a veteran I don't know if he's dead or alive but I think he's alive but we'll talk more about that later Um, after leaving the military Robert worked as a firefighter in California, but then he was forced to retire after a back injury. He then moved his family to Arizona and embarked on a career in the medical field. He worked as a surgical catheter technician, as well as a respiratory therapist. Robert had also worked as a weed sprayer for a short period of time, like in the late 1980s. The man who employed him recalled that Robert was a quiet man and suffered from serious back pain, but all in all was a good employee. He also thought that it was possible that Robert had been addicted to painkillers and hypothesized that continued use of those drugs may have spiraled him into an inexplicable homicidal rage. Robert was married to Mary Cooper in the year 1987. He was described as a cruel and distant control freak towards his family. He and his wife fought repeatedly about both sex and money, which I think is pretty typical about marriages, but it seemed like everything just had to be Robert's way, and he was not willing to let Mary make any decisions. He didn't like discuss with her about what her feelings were and the things that she wanted. She ended up taking a job later on that she had confided to her friends about and she had called it a security fund. Robert once turned a garden hose on Mary after he perceived that she had spoken out of turn. And he was embarrassed that his son, Bobby, did not like to hunt or fish. He had also tried to teach Bobby and his daughter, Brittany, how to swim by, this fucking pisses me off, he literally threw them off of a fucking boat. They were both crying. And of course, Brittany was screaming. But Robert pulled them both back into the boat and said, now there, how's that? Robert was such a crazy ass control freak that he would not allow the walls in the house to be painted anything other than white. And only a small number of pictures were even allowed to be hung on the wall. Several times, Mary's mother had made special things for the family, like quilts. You know, that's like what moms or grandmas do. They make quilts. But Mary wasn't fucking allowed to even hang them up. She had to keep them stored in the closet for a while before Robert would continually tell her over and over and over and over that it was time that she got rid of them. Even though he was a nightmare of a person, he nonetheless tried to hold on to an image as a devoted family man. Robert didn't socialize often with family because he had a self-professed fear of getting too close to people and then losing them. Robert's mother, Jan, um, had always been a yes sir type of wife and she never stood up to Robert's father. Years later, she saw similar dynamics early on in Robert and Mary's marriage. Apparently, she had like taken Mary aside and spoken to her about her concerns, but I couldn't find any information about how Mary reacted to that conversation at all. In addition, a friend of Robert's had stated to him that his own family 
bore a striking resemblance to the family of his childhood. I'm going to play you a, um, like just a little part of this video. It's a home video that was found after um, the fire and after the victim's bodies were found. Um, and it's really, really creepy. So if nothing else, the Where is Robert Fisher movie, documentary, whatever I was talking about, does show you how fucking creepy and controlling that Robert Fisher actually was because Mary's taking these home videos of the kids and him and he's just a fucking nightmare of a fucking person and honestly like without you know being overly dramatic it really did trigger me having to watch his facial expressions and um, you know, listen to the things, the controlling things that he was saying. And it was just super, super creepy. I'm going to play it for you now. Here we go. What you take pictures of? Turn that thing off. You. This is to show our boys two months old. So what? Leave them alone. That was first Thanksgiving. Big deal, he says. Let's oh, get with the food. Oh, it works with the window right Hey, Bobby. Oh. Dad hurt you? Say hi. Hi, people. Hi, people. <laughs> Pretty looking sharp today. Let's see. Show me the dress. Turn around. Turn around again. Smile. Smile pretty. Okay, now scream. <laughs> you see, I knew you could scream. God, this just pisses me the fuck off. Um, this video in particular has Robert Fisher with the ugliest fucking haircut ever. It's like he has a fucking mullet or something. His hair is all spiky in front. He's not a cute man, but anyways, um, looks aside, he's a fucking asshole. So he's holding Bobby, who's a little baby, like just a couple months old, and then Brittany's like, she's maybe two or three. I think there's a two year age difference between them. And she's standing there in a little pretty dress and Mary is taking the home movie. And apparently it's little baby Bobby's first Thanksgiving. And, and like Robert's just an absolute fucking C word to her. Like there's nothing loving, there's nothing, um, there's nothing good about this video. And it it really, honestly, just makes my skin crawl. And, yeah, it fucking triggers me because, like, I already know personally if I would have stayed with my first ex-husband much longer, he probably, I mean, some people would be like, oh, Kimmy, you're so dramatic. But I fucking believe that he would have ended up murdering me. I know I've said it before. I think it was in episode two, whichever one was the Hella Crafts um, case where Richard Crafts, her husband, killed her and froze her and put her in the wood chipper. Yeah. Um, I 1000% believe that my safety was at risk when I was married to my fucking douchebag of a... Um, first ex-husband but anyways like just watching this oh it just it sends shivers down my fucking spine that's all i can say robert had been an avid or outdoorsman hunter and fisherman since he was a young adult friends noticed him exhibiting disturbing behavior on hunting trips and other outdoor activities in one case after killing an elk he began smearing its blood on his face. And not just on his face, but on his, his chest, his torso, everywhere, which is not normal at all. Like, I grew up 
in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. People hunt. I know people hunt down here too, but like my parents hunted, even my mom, they hunted for deer. I remember at some point my dad um, hunting for a bear. I remember him taking me um, geese hunting and duck hunting. So like I grew up with all that stuff, so I understand it. But I've never seen one person ever in my life act like fucking Mel Gibson on the movie Braveheart smearing fucking blood all over himself. I mean, that's just fucking insane. On at least one occasion, Robert had even like snuck up behind a family that was out picnicking together and he emptied his fucking gun into the air, which is a total fucking dick move now this is going to upset the animal lovers out there so little trigger warning you know fast forward about 15 seconds if you don't want to hear this but it was reported and i saw a newspaper clipping online about this robert had also shot a stray pit bull in his yard he had claimed that he shot it because it attacked his labrador retriever but police maintain that he had orchestrated the encounter himself because he simply wanted to shoot the fucking dog. Robert had been an active participant in the Scottsdale Baptist Church men's ministry and had begun to withdraw from church activities. According to some of his friends, Robert spoke about committing suicide around 1998 when he was in despair over the poor condition of his marriage that same year the fishers went to the senior pastor for marital counseling counseling fisher had been unfaithful to mary while getting a massage in a massage parlor he worried that he had contracted an std and that mary would find out now what he had actually contracted while getting his little probably wasn't just a hand job i'm sure it was um um what do we call it in the last episode with charles albright oh the flat back with the sex worker i think flat back means just like regular sex i'm sure that that's what he got from the sex worker in the massage parlor um he had gotten a urinary tract infection but um that had left him ill for several days in december of 2000 so they did not have a happy marriage um mary knew that he had not been faithful to her and um it's you know been said that there were other people that he had cheated on mary with in the past but i'm not going to keep going in on that but what i do want to play for you is his fucking sister on that stupid fucking show that i was telling you about which like she's literally making fucking excuses for him and it kind of shows you what that family's mentality was how she was so deep in denial and just i i I don't even have the words to express to you how just ridiculous it sounds but i want to play it for you just so that i don't have to be the only one to have heard it okay hang on one second Mary was a good friend of mine before Robert and Mary got married when they were dating. Robert was in California and Mary was still in Arizona, so I spent a lot of time with her. And I was pregnant with our first child at that point, so she'd take me to doctor's appointments and things like that, and she was a fun person. When when she had kids, she was very much involved with her children. She loved her kids, and that became her number one priority in life. I know that my brother was in, um, unfaithful one time in their marriage. He, he had a back injury, and he went to have a massage, and he fell into temptation. Mary was gone at the time. She came back, and my brother confessed it to her, and that's when they started going through counseling. Um, the rumors that he was unfaithful in other ways, they're just rumors as far as I'm concerned. Their marriage suffered greatly after that, and I don't know if Mary ever forgave my brother after that. 
because now it doesn't even like tell us what robert's sister's fucking name is so here she went on this show documentary movie whatever the fuck piece of shit type of thing that it is and all it says is robert's sister and it shows her face and it has her real voice so like she's not even trying to hide who she is so i don't even know why she didn't put her fucking name in there it was just totally bizarre but for all purposes for this podcast we're just gonna call the bitch karen can you tell i don't like her she's absolutely a karen um So, Robert and Mary did not have a happy marriage by any means. And the neighbors had even heard them fighting often. They screamed constantly. Everybody heard it. And it was reported by their next door neighbor, Wade, who's another huge... He comes off at least like a piece of shit. I want to be fair. Maybe he's not a piece of shit. But on this movie, he comes across like a major fucking douchebag and yeah i don't like him he just gave me the heebie jeebies but anyways this wade character um had reported that nobody ever really heard robert screaming they always just heard mary screaming things at him like you're worthless i could have done better than you we should get a divorce and In all fairness, since I have been in toxic relationships, abusive relationships, it's very, very normal for women or men. Like, okay, we just, you know, watched as many people. I didn't watch any of it because I didn't give a shit about celebrities. But the whole, almost the whole world was watching the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trial. So we know it's not only women that are um, abused and treated poorly but in this case it's a woman so of course she's going to be reactive so of course she might be yelling and i've done i remember doing that i've done it in the past when um you you kind of come off as the abusive one because you're reacting to the abuse that you're having to go through and you just feel like you're stuck and you can't get out of it and you're frustrated so you know i am five thousand percent sure that robert was the fucking abusive one and if they heard mary screaming it's just because she was so fucking sick of his shit like i heard that mary had been like a very outspoken vocal person and she was like quite literally just done with him and she wasn't going to be putting up with and letting him like treat her like a piece of garbage anymore and good on her so fuck you wade because you don't know what you're talking about it sounds like wade had a little man crush or like wanted to have a little bromance with robert because i don't understand why wade would instigate himself so much into you know, what their marriage was like and who the abusive one was because he wasn't in the fucking house. So, you know, it, he's just like a nosy person that whatever, just wanted to have some say in it and maybe be on TV. But anyways, I don't like Wade. Can you tell? <laughs> Robert had told a hunting companion that he was renewing his commitment to his faith and his marriage because, quote, he could not live without his family and he was possibly even hinting that he would consider suicide over getting a divorce according to psychologists an intense fear of loss is not at all unusual among individuals who were traumatized by a divorce in adolescence around the same time which was just weeks before she would be murdered Mary had told several of her friends that she was going to divorce Robert. And quite frankly, I'm even shocked that he allowed her to even have friends. So, you know, on any of my case sources that I found that she was talking to friends, I almost feel like besides family members like Robert's mom or maybe her own family, I feel like anybody that considered themselves Mary's friend was merely an acquaintance because I don't understand um, 
how Robert would have allowed her the opportunity to really make friendships, like true friendships. You know what I mean? So, I don't know. I hope she had, I hope she had somebody, you know, that it helped that she could confide in and help her like relieve some stress and tension and and worry and stuff and I guess it doesn't even fucking matter in the end because you know of what happens but anyways I guess I'm just thinking out loud (laughs) I guess that's what my podcast is for Kimmy can just talk out loud and somebody's gonna have to listen I mean you could always turn me off but whatever (laughs) isn't it better to turn me on (laughs) all right so anyways guys a neighbor reported hearing a loud argument coming from inside the Fisher home at 10 p.m on April 9th of 2001 approximately 10 hours before the house exploded into flames police theorized that the murders took place sometime between 9.30 p.m. and 10.15 p.m. At 10.43 p.m., now this is crazy, Robert was spotted on an ATM camera, and he was withdrawing money. He only took $280, which is a random fucking amount of money. Like, why not just take $300? Like, you know what I mean? I don't understand why it was like 280. Is that all they had in their account? Like, I didn't understand. Um, Mary's Toyota 4Runner could be seen in the background on that camera. It is possible that Robert later returned to the house and committed the murders, but police believe that they had already taken place by then since he was using Mary's vehicle and that the vehicle in which he is alleged to have taken when he fled. So they think that Robert murdered the kids and Mary and then took her vehicle, went to the ATM, took $280 out, and that's when he, like, took off. You know, so, I mean, it seems legit. I kind of believe that that's the timeline as well. I don't really think that he would go on camera like, I don't think he'd go to the ATM first with Mary's vehicle. Um, he had his own truck. He had, like, a diesel truck. So he could have taken that truck to the ATM. So just the fact that he had taken Mary's forerunner makes me think that he had already killed them. Mary Fisher had had her throat slashed and had also been shot in the back of the head. Okay, guys, so... I'm remembering to say a little trigger warning about the kids, okay, the brutality, okay? So um, skip ahead like maybe a minute at the most if you don't want to hear this. But Brittany and Bobby's throats were both slashed from ear to ear. In fact, their cuts had been so deep that they had both nearly been decapitated. And it just makes me... It makes me so sad. At 8.42 a.m. on April 10th, 2001, that is when the house exploded. Firefighters were immediately alerted to the explosion, which was strong enough to collapse the front brick wall and rattle the frames of neighboring houses for a half a mile in every direction. So just picture that. A half a mile in all directions like imagine sitting in your house right now and all of a sudden everything start rattling because a house about a half a mile away just fucking explodes suddenly i mean that's just it's nuts to think about that you know um before firefighters arrived to the scene neighbors were using garden hoses to try to keep the flames under control because like they didn't want the fire to spread and like burn down the whole fucking neighborhood um thankfully the firefighters managed to keep the 20 foot high blaze from spreading to the other houses though a series of smaller secondary explosions believed to be caused by either rifle ammunition or paint cans forced them to keep their distance at one point. Upon investigation at the scene, they found that the gas line from the back of the house's furnace had been pulled. 
the accumulating gas was later ignited by a candle that Robert Fisher had allegedly lit and left there sitting on a table, just waiting, just waiting to ignite. This delayed fuse gave Robert an approximate 10 hour head start in his successful attempt to evade law enforcement. The decision to cause the house to explode is believed to have been an attempt by Robert to conceal evidence of the murders and possibly even to cause police to believe that he had also died in the explosion. The burned bodies of a woman, Mary, and two children, Brittany and Bobby, were found lying in their beds in the burned out remains. Mary was 38 years old, Brittany was 12 years old, and Bobby was only 10. Investigators theorized that Robert murdered his family because he felt threatened by Mary's intention to divorce him and did not want Brittany and Bobby to go through what he had gone through as a child. So this motherfucker is like, okay, well, I don't want you to be products of a divorced household, so I'm just going to fucking murder you instead, you know? Like, that's any better. Robert Fisher had an expensive gun safe that, he, that survived the house fire. Police found several guns inside along with family videos, all in pristine condition. However, police found no sign of a missing revolver, which was thought to have been the murder weapon. All that was recovered was an empty case that used to house the missing revolver. So, Robert, who had disappeared at the time of the murders, was named an official as well as the only person of interest in this case. On April 14th, 2001, Arizona Department of Public Safety officers were instructed in a statewide bulletin to arrest him. On April 20th, the last physical evidence of his whereabouts surfaced when police found Mary's Toyota Forerunner in Tonto National Forest. This is near the towns of Young and Payson, Arizona, about 100 miles north of Scottsdale. The family dog, a black lab named Blue, was found outside the car. It had taken shelter beneath the car and when police found blue blue was in a hungry um, was very hungry and very agitated so it's really confusing about like why blue was left there i mean i understand i mean i remember reading reports that robert self-professed that he loved blue he loved his dog more than he loved anybody else in the family and like i'm an animal person so i get it but um i don't understand so he didn't want the dog to die in the explosion but then he just left the dog in the woods and by all means i'm sure blue was like so fucking happy like peace out bitch i'm done putting up with all your bullshit you murdered my kids you murdered my mommy so like fuck you you know but just to leave your dog alone in the woods um that seems super cruel to me because yes you know when you think of it in one way a dog is capable of like you know maybe finding some food out there on their own but I mean, this is a house pet, so you're still putting that dog in danger of, like, other animals, like, wild fucking animals that can kill the dog. So, I just think it's really weird that Robert did not take the dog to, like, a shelter before he, like, murdered and murdered, you know, his family. I don't know. It just seems like not that I would ever murder my family or anyone, but if I was going to be a psychopath and a family annihilator, then like I have three inside pets and I'm going to talk about my outside kitty, Dahlia, in a minute. I named her Dahlia for Black Dahlia because she's a beautiful black kitty 
with beautiful, beautiful green eyes. And she's apparently adopted me. But if I was planning on murdering my family and making my house explode, I would probably, I would probably honestly bring my animals somewhere and like give them away. I would not take them with me and just desert them out in the middle of the woods. Like that seems, that seems sus for sure. So with that being said, that's one of the only things that would make me think that Robert Fisher is no longer alive. But I do think he's alive. But that's like the only type of clue that makes me think, hmm, he loved his dog. And his dog was left all by itself, like hiding, scared, starving to death underneath this forerunner. So it's, it's just super, super fucking strange, you know? Um... An Oakland Raiders hat was identified inside the vehicle to be the one that Robert was seen wearing in the ATM footage. And this is fucking gross. I mean, I understand if you got to go, you got to go. But if you're in the fucking woods, there's so many fucking places that you can do this. But I'm just going to say it out loud right now. A pile of fucking shit was found on the ground near the passenger side door. Like, a pile of shit. A pile of Robert Fisher's shit. And no, it's not Robert Fisher laying there in a pile. Like, just, like, hey, you know, why don't you go ahead and arrest me? Because I'm a big piece of shit. No, it's actually fucking shit from a piece of shit's ass like if that is even possible like that is so gross so that is just like a big fuck you to everybody by him doing that because literally if I'm in the woods and I have to take a shit I'm gonna try not to take a shit but if that's my only option I'm absolutely gonna go dig a hole behind a tree and wipe my ass with some leaves or whatever I'm not gonna leave my shit on the ground next to my my um, spouse's car and especially not if my dog is like walking around I mean I it, that's just fucking weird so it was proven that it was I mean I don't know how it was proven but like some people said that it was probably dog shit but then police investigators were like no it's human feces so I don't know but it's fucking gross Although police searched the area immediately around where the vehicle was discovered, they only, and this pisses me off, they only searched one out of dozens of nearby caves. The only cave that they chose to search was um, Cave 41. Does that mean that there's like 40 other caves that they did not search because I heard that there were three caves that were like right there that Robert Fisher could have hid in he could have committed suicide in it he could have just like hid in there like I absolutely believe that he could have been hiding out but to just fucking like search one cave that makes no sense because if you're only going to search one cave when there's so many caves, you may as well not fucking search any. You know what I mean? That that just, like, doesn't even make sense just to choose one. But whatever. Some of these caves form a complex underground network, and they extend for miles beneath the surface of the ground. Several professional cavers have even suggested that Robert used them as a hiding place before either escaping, killing himself, or dying from low oxygen levels. Professional cavers have visited these caves many times in the years since the murders, but no sign of Fisher has ever emerged. So, as much as I hate to admit it, it seems like Robert Fisher, like, totally premeditated this, like, It was not just a spur-of-the-moment decision. Like, I know he's an outdoorsman. I know he knows the area. But he totally had a plan. And it sounds like as much as I can't stand this motherfucker, he was actually pretty smart. And I really, really hate to admit that. But he brought that forerunner out there. He left his dog. 
Um, there's so many caves there. There's so many options of things that he could have done. It like, and then he had like a good 10 hours in between when he murdered the family or allegedly murdered the family. Just to be clear, like, so I don't get sued. He allegedly murdered the family. And when um, the explosion happened, like, he had, like, a really, really good head start. So, um, I, I don't know. It, it's, it's crazy how much he planned all of this. In addition, less than a mile from where the Toyota 4Runner was found is the Fort Apache Indian Reservation, which this is an area that police never searched. Quite frankly, like I heard on another podcast, like somebody was like bitching that the police did not search the Indian Reservation, but they're not fucking allowed to search the Indian Reservation. Just in case people don't know that. Um, An Indian reservation is private property and like the regular like police department cannot just set foot on that property. So, you know, I mean, after, you know, what we, what did we do to the Native Americans like back in the day? I mean, it's fucking crazy. So, no, um, it's hideous what was done by our ancestors back in the day. So, we're not allowed just to like show up there and be like oh like we're looking for this fugitive no like we cannot do that but police did follow a set of footprints that led onto the reservation but they were not able to recover any sign of robert fisher and i don't know whether or not they ever reached out to the fort apache indian reservation or to their police department because Um, They have their own police department, so I don't know if there was ever any communication, you know, between any of these people, but it doesn't say, and I I wasn't able to find any of it in case sources. A couple, though, had reported seeing a man who resembled Robert Fisher walking along the nearby Young Road several days before the discovery of the car. So they didn't say anything at the time, but after they saw on the news that the vehicle had been found and everybody was looking for Robert Fisher, this couple, you know, called in and reported, hey, you know, we saw this dude that resembled him but didn't think anything of it at the time. Um, Lori Greenbeck, who was an acquaintance of the Fisher family, had said that her husband had gone camping with Robert in the area where the truck was found just shortly before that on April 10th. So um, shortly before April 10th, her like, I don't know if it was like a week or two before, her husband and Robert Fisher were out there dry, like camping and riding on their quads. And I guess the husband had reported back to Lori that Like, he felt, like, really uneasy because, like, Robert was, like, just, um, was just able to, like, know where everything was, like, in the fucking dark and was just riding all over the place like a crazy person. But, you know, they both figured that they believed that Robert was probably scouting the area at that time. You know, he seemed very familiar with the region and the landscape and where everything was. On July 19th, a state arrest warrant was issued in Phoenix, charging the missing Robert Fisher with three counts of first-degree murder and one count of arson. Subsequently, he was declared a fugitive and a federal arrest warrant was issued by the U.S. District Court for the District of Arizona, and they charged him with unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. On June 29, 2002, Fisher was named by the FBI as the 475th fugitive to be placed on its 10 most wanted list. He was also on America's Most Wanted's Dirty Dozen episode, the list of its most notorious fugitives, and was also profiled on The Hunt with John Walsh. The FBI 
offers a reward of up to $100,000 for information leading to Robert Fisher's capture. By April 2003, by April of 2003, 2003, <laughs> did you hear me? April 2003, come on, Kimmy, get the fuck together. By April 2003, the FBI had received hundreds and hundreds of leads. However, all reported sightings of Robert Fisher have either been inconclusive or entirely false. In the years immediately following Fisher's disappearance, some people living in his old neighborhood reported seeing a man resembling him driving around in the area. In February 2004, an individual with a striking physical resemblance to Fisher was arrested in Vancouver, Canada by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. The man had a missing tooth where Robert Fisher had a gold bicuspid and he also had the same exact surgical scar on his back. Like, what are the chances, right? However, this is crazy, but his fingerprints did not match. He was held by Canadian police for approximately one week until one of the man's relatives, I think it was his mom, I think his mama came and saved him. She came in and correctly identified him. And although he, you know, had a um, rap sheet himself in Canada, I mean, it was not Robert Fisher. As much as everybody wanted it to be, it was not. Responding to speculation that his fingerprints had been altered, Scottsdale detective John Kirkham said that there was no scarring to his fingertips to suggest that this had been done. Plus, I heard that that is, not that it matters, because if you kill somebody, that's against the law, but that's against the law, too, and it's going to be really, really obvious if all of your um, fingerprints are all burned off, you're going to have scars. So anyways, the man in Canada, in Vancouver, Canada, that man's identity was never, ever released. But another thing about that fucking show that I did not like was the motherfucker Wade. Remember the neighbor that I was like talking shit about earlier? Motherfucking Wade lived in Seattle, Washington at this time. So I don't know why it was that, like, he moved from Arizona to Seattle, Washington. Um, But he took it upon himself to try to finagle his way into the whole investigation, which is really, really weird that the police would allow him to do this, but I guess they were desperate. I mean, that's my only guess is they were so fucking desperate that they had to get this jackass to try to find out if this was indeed Robert Fisher. Check out this bullshit. He had been missing. The case had gone a little cold and somebody had reported him up in Canada, up in a little area called White Rock. It was someone who looked like Fisher. Um, someone saw the wanted poster. Um, they called it into the Canadian authorities. And I remember when they thought that they had found Fisher in Canada. John Kirkham called me. It was late at night. And he said, Tammy, this is it. We think we got him. We think we got him. We started out roller, going through the roller coaster again of what we would do if it is Robert, how we would help him through the jail situation. Um, the same thought processes go through your head every time there's something else on the news about it. Well, I was living in Seattle, not too far. I said, well, I'm not doing anything. I can go up, you know, and see if it's really him. I'm kind of curious how this works out. So I went up to Canada. They basically pretended to book me into jail so that they could get me and Bob into the same room so that I could look at him face to face and hear him talk, see him walk, and hopefully identify this guy. So what they did was by pretending to book me, there was a hallway, he came walking out of that hall. When he came out, he walked down the hall, he's standing with his lawyer, and he's standing, you know, with his girlfriend. He looked up and he scanned the room, like anybody does when they walk into a strange place. Well, when he looked at me and I heard his voice, 
I knew it was him. And he stopped. He did that little look around the room and he scanned. And he came back to me and he just sort of got this instant look on his face like, what the hell are you doing here? And I was looking at him going, oh my God. And inside just, that's him. That's my old neighbor. I see this guy recognize me. I know he recognized me. He stared at me for a good 30 seconds before his lawyer had to interrupt him and get his attention off of me. They took me out after I gave him the signal and said, well, what do you think, what do you think? I'm like, that's him, that's him, don't let him go. I got in my car, I went back home. I called my parents and I said, yep, they got him. Now, I understand, like, that seems like it should have been Robert Fisher. And Wade, the neighbor, obviously wanted that to be him. I don't know how much was him actually believing that it was or him just wanting it to be so that he could be right and feel more important. That's kind of like the feeling I got from watching it. Um, But, you know, you can't, you cannot, like argued the point that the fingerprints proved that that man was not Robert Fisher. So anyways, after that, um, the FBI alerted, alerted local law enforcement in the year 2012 that Fisher may have been living in the Payson area in Gila County, Arizona. And then in October of 2014, police raided a house in Commerce City, Colorado after receiving a tip that Robert was hiding there. Now, despite arresting two of its occupants, they did not find any sign of Robert Fisher. Like, where the fuck was he? It's just crazy. In April of 2016, FBI officials and Scottsdale police displayed new age-enhanced photos of Robert Fisher during a news conference on the 15th anniversary of the murders. Um, But just recently, just last November 3rd of 2021, Robert Fisher was removed from the FBI top 10 most wanted list. Despite his removal, though, Um, he does still remain a wanted fugitive. So we should still, like, be looking out for him and, you know, report it if we see, if we have any sightings of this fucking piece of garbage. The murders allegedly committed by Robert Fisher and his subsequent disappearance have attracted significant attention and numerous theories have spawned about what ultimately happened to him. Due in part to factors such as the length of time that has gone by since the motherfucker's disappearance, the small amount of money that Fisher is believed to have had with him, because what the fuck is $280 going to do? Like, what what the fuck ever? And the small amount of... um, no, no, no. I'm, I'm just like reading that again. And the fact, sorry, <laughs> I could edit that out, but I probably won't because I'm lazy sometimes. But anyways, the third thing is the fact that he had spoken of ending his life before. So there's been a lot of speculation that he may and probably had committed suicide. So personally, I think Robert Fisher is far too fucking narcissistic to ever commit suicide. Like, he may, like, talk a good game for attention, but honestly, mm, like, watching the videos of him and just seeing how he treated Mary and the kids, it was just so eerie and creepy and so mm, off-putting. I can't think of any more words. I don't think that he's the type of guy, I could be wrong, I don't think he's the type of guy that would commit suicide. And as far as the $280 goes, that was fucking weird. Like, I don't even understand why you would kill your family and then go to the ATM when you know there's going to be a camera there just to take out that much money. So, I guess that He was a guy that hated debt and he liked to pay cash for everything. So 
if this whole thing was premeditated, I really honestly believe that he had put some money away and he may have had it hidden somewhere. Like, fuck, for all we know, he had it like in fucking coffee cans or jars, glass jars and buried like in the yard, you know? I don't know. I don't know. But I absolutely believe he's alive personally. And, you know, obviously he needed to have some more money in order to be able to get away. So I do not, I do not think that he's dead at all. So, um, yeah. Some people say that he probably died somewhere out in the wilderness or inside one of the caves where Mary's car was discovered. And that is a possibility. But I still really feel that he's alive. You know what I mean? Like they're just like, well, he died. He may have committed suicide. His body was simply never found. Mm, I don't know. It just seems weird because of that one couple that saw him walking. Um, I don't know. It is thought also that he may have started a new life under an assumed identity. That's me. Another possibility is that, um, he died after years on the run as a fugitive, but his remains have not yet been identified. I don't believe that's true either because I believe that If he died and his remains were found, he would have been identified. So, I mean, what if he would have been, like, the um, victim of a serial killer? And, like, maybe his body is, like, burnt, like, buried in a shallow grave somewhere or something. I don't know. I guess anything's possible and that he would actually be deserving of that. But if Robert did survive, it is thought possible that he had hitchhiked out of the area or he did have aid from an accomplice. And there were rumors floating around that he had had a girlfriend. Um, The police did go to Mayo Clinic where he worked in Scottsdale and kind of asked questions, you know, to see if there was any women that stopped showing up for work or maybe took vacation time around the time that Robert Fisher disappeared, but um, that was inconclusive. They couldn't find out any information. So that's a possibility. And then there was some kind of, um, some kind of report that somebody at a bar that was working at a bar or at a bar thought that they saw Robert with a woman, but he was kind of trying to hide his face. And I guess he had taken a shot of some kind of alcohol that was reportedly something that Robert always liked to drink. I can't think of what it was. Um, Maybe some type of whiskey. But, um, yeah, so who fucking knows? I mean, all I know is that he has not been apprehended and he has not had to pay for the crimes of allegedly killing Mary and his kids. Um, There's a theory that he may have just been using his survival skills to continue living in the wilderness near Payson where Mary's car was discovered. I don't think this is true, though, because, I mean, police and survival experts are also skeptical about this. And due to the difficulty of finding food and shelter in that environment... Um, plus no evidence ever emerged that someone was living in the woods in that area. I just feel that he had 10 hours to get away. And if you're like, if you have like any, like maybe even five brain cells in your motherfucking head, you're going to make a run for it. You're not just going to hide out like a hundred miles away from where you murdered your family and blew up your whole fucking house. You know, that just seems weird. Robert could be living in a small town where he gets paid cash and he works as a handyman, or he could be in a big city and blend right in. Right. You know, you just never know. It could be one or the other. It was also considered that Robert may have crossed the Southern United States border So, apparently, there was a hostile encounter. 
and this encounter occurred in Guatemala in the year 2009. So it was between some tourists and a man that was said to have resembled Robert Fisher. So apparently, you know how like when you're on vacation or anywhere really, um, somebody's taking a picture, like a selfie, like say there's a couple taking a selfie of themselves on vacation and you're kind of like caught in the background of said selfie. Um, that's what happened. So apparently some dude that resembled Robert Fisher got like really pissed off at these tourists that had taken a picture, but gotten him in the background. So I don't know. But since Robert's disappearance took place before the September 11th attacks, border security was much more lax at that time than it would have later become. So police did consider this to be a reasonable possibility. Police have speculated that Robert could have very well have started a brand new family and have cited the fear that he might eventually decide to leave and annihilate that family as well. And this has literally been listed as one of their chief reasons for continuing to search for him. Some police have conceded that they may never learn what had happened to Robert Fisher. FBI agent Bob Caldwell's sense of his personality and habits is that he's incredibly arrogant, he's cocky, he's a know-it-all, and a loner. Robert Fisher has been known to chew tobacco, and he favors the Copenhagen brand, which, guys, I have to tell you, but the ex-husband that I was talking about earlier, he chewed the Copenhagen brand, so it's just so weird. It's like, ugh, yuck. So, apparently, douchebags chew Copenhagen. <laughs> Robert's look has been described as average, but he sometimes walks in an odd, erect manner with his chest out due to a back problem that stemmed from the injury that he suffered as a firefighter. And remember, he is an avid hunter and fisherman, so he could live off the land if it was necessary. But still, there's going to be some signs that he's living off the land. So I don't think he's... I don't think he's at the place where Mary's vehicle was found. He may be living off the land somewhere else, but it's definitely not there. Like that guy hightailed it out of there. Robert Fisher, guys, like listen to me. Robert Fisher is considered armed and extremely dangerous. And he does have ties to Florida. Hello, that's where I live, as well as New Mexico. Right now, Fisher would be in his early 60s if he's still alive. I'm going to be posting on my Instagram some of the pictures that the FBI released about like what Robert Fisher could look like right now. And um, yeah, just keep your eyes posted. Like, I don't know if that $100,000 reward is still open, but gosh, wouldn't it be amazing if one of the listeners of this podcast actually spotted that motherfucker somewhere and got a hundred fucking thousand dollars. I would love that. But anyways, people who have information on Robert Fisher's whereabouts are advised to call Scottsdale police at this number, 480-312-5500. And I do also want to just put it out there that if you are experiencing any kind of abuse, domestic violence, if you are afraid for your life, if you feel like your life is in danger, if you are walking on eggshells, like that's abuse as well. Like everything that Robert Fisher was doing to Mary and was reported in the home videos that's all abuse okay some of it's more subtle but it's abuse all the same so make sure that i mean i know it's embarrassing and i know for a fact that it's not always easy and i know that there are the um the different um stages of abuse so 
you know, as soon as you think that you can't stand it anymore and you need to leave, then all of a sudden your abuser will start to love bomb you and be kind. And then you'll start to doubt yourself and be like, oh, okay, well, now he's changed. And that, you know, he won't ever treat me like that again. Girl, he will. He will absolutely treat you that way again. Okay, I know this for a fact. So get some help. Get a trusted person to help you leave or just leave. If there's kids involved, and I'm not saying that this is easy because I've been in this position where you're married, your um, income is tied to that person. But truth be told, you still need to leave because we do not want to be hearing about your death, your murder by, you know, at the hands of whatever motherfucker is abusing you. So just do it, okay? Just do it. I'm sure that, you know, Mary Fisher had plans to leave Robert Fisher, but she could not leave before he basically executed her and her children. So um, just leave, okay? If you need to reach out to a family member, a friend, there's hotlines. Um, Damn, like, send me a message, like, you know, just talk to somebody. Um, the worst thing you can do is hide it because you're ashamed. And the second worst thing that you can do is stay there. Okay. Because you're hoping that it's going to change because you know, as well as I know that it's not going to change. So, all right, guys. So that is the case of Robert fucking douchebag Fisher. And I hope, I really, really hope that he is apprehended. Or if he is dead, I hope that his body is found so that we can, like, just put this case to rest. I mean, I want him to be alive so that he can, you know, have the justice that he so well deserves. But I guess we'll just wait and see, right? Um, I do also want to mention that before I started podcasting today, I went downtown. Um, I live like a mile away from downtown Pensacola and it's a beautiful area, but I was going downtown to an appointment and I was driving past this park and it was all like taped up with police tape and there were a bunch of police cars and everything there and um so apparently there was a woman's body found on the water or like on the edge of the water at about 10 30 a.m this morning which like literally guys this park is less than one fucking mile away from my house and Police so far have said that they don't believe that she died of natural causes. So that story is going, you know, more details are going to be, you know, pending. But I'll be sure to keep you guys posted. I did make like a brief post in my Instagram story today. But um, yeah, it's crazy that, you know, there might have been a murder victim so close to my house. I mean, I know I do live in Florida and there are a lot of Pensacola cases that I can start to tell you guys about and I'll probably weave some in. And I've also, like I know of one case from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan from when I lived there that I wanna talk about. And I went to research that this morning to start doing some notes on it. And I happened to drop into rabbit holes of other murder cases that have happened up there like recently like I moved away from there in the year like 1991 so um 1990 1991 something like that but anyways I didn't realize that there were more murders up there and potential serial killers like if you're familiar with the upper peninsula of Michigan It is a small, small, small area. And just the fact that I was finding so many murder cases and serial killer cases, like 
I was like so fucking shocked. If you could have seen the look on my face, I bet it was fucking funny. Because I like thought that I was going to just find the one case that I'm preparing to do very soon. But then I like saw these other ones. And I'm like, holy mother of God. Like, so I don't know, guys. So just keep the family of the woman that was found in the Pensacola Park in your prayers and continue to keep the family of Mary Fisher in your prayers. In fact, there was one thing that I did not talk about. Um, Fuck, I do not like Mary Fisher's dad. Mary Fisher's dad, if you go and watch that movie slash documentary, piece of trash, garbage, you know, that I was telling you guys about, there are interviews with Mary Fisher's dad, and he's a fucking asshole. Like, he was sitting there pleading and crying for Robert to come back and explain himself. He kept talking to the interviewers about how much he loved Robert. And there was one point where he almost said, Robert, you know, if you did something, he started to say, I understand, but then he cut himself off. He said, please explain yourself. I love you, Robert, blah, 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 blah. Now he passed away, I believe. I believe he passed away in the year 2009. And I'm not going to hold back. I thought he was a huge fucking dick face. And I honestly believe that that is part of the reason. That man is part of the reason that Mary Fisher was married to Robert Fisher in the first place. Because I have to imagine, although I could not do any research on what her childhood and her upbringing was like, I can only imagine that it was not fucking awesome. I have to imagine that it was just as bad as Robert Fisher's childhood. And I know based on my childhood that when I met my ex-husband, like I rushed in to the relationship with him. I rushed into marriage. He was older than me. Like I see all these red flags now. And I'm almost fucking certain that Mary Fisher saw those red flags as well. But she may have been just desperate to get out of whatever situation was going on in her parents' household. You know, like, like we don't know. So I'm just, I'm just kind of like guessing why Mary would have been attracted to somebody so arrogant and narcissistic like Robert Fisher because guys like if you watch any of those videos he did not treat her nicely he did not treat the kids lovingly he was just like a robot a controlling robot that's what he was so if you watch where's Robert Fisher you guys are gonna hear my voice the whole time saying I fucking hate this because Um, They even show, guys, they even show the bodies, not just once, like the charred remains, they show all three victims' bodies, not just one time, but like four fucking times. And it's gruesome and they don't give you any fucking warning whatsoever. They just show you. And it's proven that (laughs) the way they're laying there, hold on, I got to clear my throat. They were laying in their beds and their throats had been slashed. So when there was a fire in the house or when it exploded, like one of them at least would have gotten out of bed. But no, Um, it was proved that the bodies, you know, that they were killed before the explosion ever even happened. But just the fact that they keep showing the fucking dead bodies over and over and over and over again was so grisly and just fucking disturbing. Like, nothing really quite gets to me, but it's like one of those things that you cannot unsee. I know I've said it before in other episodes. You can't unsee it once you see it. And it would have been nice for them to give some kind of warning, like, hey, we're going to show you some fucking dead bodies right now. So, ugh, it was nasty. I fucking was pissed off that the director did it did them that way because it felt like 
he was being very disrespectful of the victims. And the victims are the ones that deserve prayers, thoughts, um, all that, all those kind of things, okay? So, like, fuck that guy who made that show. I, I don't like him. So, and if he's listening to this right now, fuck you. I don't like you. <laughs> but anyways, guys, um, I'm going to stop this right here. Be sure to follow me on all of the things. And don't forget, there's a Patreon. There's three tiers over on the Patreon if you want to start getting some extra bonus content. Or um, even just support me in my endeavors with this podcast because it's really, really fun. And really the only way that I can continue to do this on a weekly basis and give you guys extra bonus content is if I have some people like you supporting me in those endeavors. So anyways, guys, until next time, you know what I'm going to say, right? Keep talking crime.